Hello everyone, welcome to 10 Minute Physiology. In today's video, I'm gonna give you a short explanation as to what isometric contractions are and what they about what they teach us about the muscle. So with that, let's give it a go. So I'd like to start off by first explaining to you what an isometric contraction is. So an isometric contraction is a contraction in which the muscle length remains constant. So in order to understand that, I have an experiment. So in this experiment, we have a skeletal muscle that is affixed at two ends, so this end and that end. And what we're going to do is we have an electrode attached to it, and this electrode is going to pass a stimulus into the muscle, causing it to contract. Now, when we put the stimulus into the muscle, what happens is, is the muscle contracts, and the two ends of the muscle are going to experience a force. Now, the force generated by this contraction is going to try to bring the ends of the muscle towards the center of it. So whenever a muscle contracts, the two ends experience a force that drives them towards the center of the muscle. But in an isometric contraction, the plates here prevent the ends of the muscle from moving inward, so therefore the length is going to remain constant. So in this isometric contraction, if we were to display what the force was experienced by these plates per unit time, what we would see is something like this. So the force gradually increases to a maximum point, then after that the force drops off as the muscle relaxes. So now that we know what an isometric contraction is, let's talk about something called passive tension. So what is passive tension? Well, you can think of muscles as a spring. So muscles sort of ha act like a spring because they have elastic properties. And these elastic properties come from the proteins that are inside the muscle cell. So you can think of each muscle as a spring, as we see right here. Now, whenever you have a spring, imagine you take a spring and you stretch it out. So you stretch out the spring. So what happens when you let go of that spring? Well, when you let go of that spring, the spring recoils back to its equilibrium position. So in other words, if you were to stretch a spring out and then release it, the two ends of that spring would move back towards the center and it would go towards its equilibrium position again. So the same can be said about a muscle. So whenever you stretch a muscle out, the muscle acts like a spring. So if you were to let go of that muscle, the muscle would spring back to its original position. So in order to understand that, let's talk about this experiment. So let's just say we have a muscle, and this muscle is attached at two points. So this muscle's stat is attached at two points, and we stretch out this muscle to length one. Now, this muscle is going to be experiencing a recoil force because it is a spring. Whenever you stretch out a spring, that spring has a recoil force, and that recoil force can be seen when you let go of the spring because when you let go of it, the spring recoils back to its original position. So this muscle is experiencing a specific recoil force of a specific magnitude. So let's just say we stretch out this muscle further. So if you stretch out this muscle further, that is equivalent to stretching out a spring fur further. And the further you stretch out a spring, the higher that recoil force is, or the stronger that recoil force is. So the greater the amount you stretch out a spring, the stronger the recoil force is. And we can see that in this figure here. So we stretch out the muscle further, the recoil force increased in strength. And if we were to increase the muscle length even further, what we would see is the recoil force increases even more. So this recoil force that the muscle experiences when it's stretched out is going to be the passive tension. So as we increase the length of the muscle, we increase the recoil force, and as we increase the recoil force, we increase the passive tension. So passive tension is going to increase as the length of the muscle increases. So now let's take a look at the difference between active tension and passive tension. So passive tension is tension not due to the electrical stimulation or contraction of the muscle. It's generated by the elastic properties of the muscle. 
So in other words, as you increase the stretch of the muscle, so as you stretch out a muscle further, the passive tension is going to increase. Now the active tension is the tension that is generated by electrical stimulation or contraction. So now let's put these two things together in a muscle and see how they play out. So in order to understand this, we're gonna look at two things. So right here on this graph, we have an x-axis and a y-axis. So on the x-axis, we have the percentage of optimal length. So the optimal length of a muscle is the length at which the muscle is going to generate the greatest amount of active tension. So it's going to be the length at which the muscle generates the greatest amount of force during a contraction. And we'll talk about what that optimal length is at the cellular level in a little bit. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of active tension. So with that, let's take a look at passive tension and active tension and total tension. So let's first look at passive tension. So passive tension, as we see right here, increases as we increase the length or stretch of a muscle. So as we increase the stretch of a muscle, we increase the recoil force. And as we increase the recoil force, we increase the passive tension. Now, the passive curve, as I sh told you, is going to measure the tension that at different muscle lengths. So the passive curve shows tension at different muscle lengths before contraction occurs. And as we see with this curve, we see that the passive tension is going to increase with muscle length or stretch. So the next curve is going to measure the total tension. So the total tension is going to show the tension measured at different muscle lengths during a muscle contraction. So how can we find the active tension from this? Well, the active tension is just going to be the difference between the total tension and the passive tension at two different points. So it's the difference between total tension and passive tension at any point on the x-axis. So as we see, we, with this graph here, we see a few things. So the first thing that we see is that as we approach the optimal muscle length, the active tension is going to increase. But as we go further from the optimal length, so as we get longer from the optimal length, because the optimal length is going to be at 100, so as we surpass that optimal length, the active tension is going to decrease until it gets to zero at around this point. Because remember, the active tension is just the difference between, between the blue curve and the green curve. So now what we're going to do is we're going to just plot active tension on the same graph we were talking about before. So if you were to plot active tension on this graph, what you would get is something like this. So from this graph, we basically see a few different points. So the first point is that when you are below the optimal length, what happens is, is basically you start to decrease the force of contraction generated. So the active tension that you can produce from a muscle decreases as you decrease the length from the optimal length. So what, what is the reason for this? Well, if we start to decrease the length of a muscle below the optimal length, this can basically cause steric hindrance to occur between the actin and myosin filaments. So therefore, this can lead to a decrease in the amount of cross bridge formation. And when you decrease the amount of cross bridges, you decrease the force of contraction. So the second point is that when we go beyond the optimal length, we see a similar circumstance, that as we increase a muscle stretch beyond the optimal length, we see that the force of contraction or active tension decreases as well. And the reason for this is because if you stretch a muscle beyond the optimal length, this basically decreases the amount of overlap between the actin and myosin filaments. And when you do this, you decrease the amount of cross bridges, and this therefore decreases the amount of contraction. And the final point is that there is a optimum length. 
at which you have a maximum amount of force generated due to the fact that there is a maximum overlap between the filaments. So when you increase the amount of overlap, you increase the amount of cross bridges. And when you increase the amount of cross bridges, you increase the force of contraction. So it's at this optimal length that we have the maximum amount of overlap between cross bridge between the two filaments, therefore producing the greatest amount of cross bridges. So in summary, we talked about how isometric contractions are contractions that occur in muscles where the length is constant. We also talked about that the two types of tension, active and passive. And we also talked about how the length of a muscle correlates with the force generated by a muscle. So I thank you for watching this video and I hope it helped you understand what isometric contractions were. And I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching and see you next time.